Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gail Zimprea, the Chief Quality and Risk Management Officer here at McLean Hospital, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here for the Edward P. Lawrence Quality Care Lecture, which honors longtime McLean trustee and supporter, Attorney Ed Lawrence. Ed served as Chair of Partners Healthcare, now Mass General Brigham, for 16 years, and in addition, he provided thoughtful and compassionate advice as a member of McLean's Board of Trustees for over a decade. He was and continues to be well respected by his peers and colleagues. We're extremely grateful to have his continued involvement as an honorary trustee. Here at McLean, Ed's legacy continues in our day-to-day -day focus on the quality of the care that we provide and our research. As the first chair of the hospital's Board of Trustee Quality of Care Committee, Ed was instrumental in efforts to set quality management expectations and to establish processes to meet those expectations. Today's presentation by Dr. Keda Mate is one of the ways we wish to recognize Ed for the important impact he has on McLean and on our efforts to reach ever higher levels of quality in our work. Ed, we're delighted that you're able to join us today and thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for McLean. It's a great, uh, can I be heard at this point? Yes, we can, every, yeah, I believe we can hear you. I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be back, even though only virtually, to be back with you all at McLean for this uh, very important occasion and to welcome Dr. Mate. Uh, we are very fortunate to have him today. And I know we will all learn a lot from his, from his com comments and thoughtful uh, analysis on these subjects that we care so much about. So thank you all for being here. And again, thank you, Dr. Mate. Thank you very much, Ed. So before I introduce Dr. Mate, I've been asked to remind folks that if you have any questions throughout the presentation or immediately thereafter, please write them in the Q&A box, which um, you'll find located at the bottom of the screen. So Dr. Keda Mate is President and Chief Executive Officer at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, of which I had the great pleasure and honor of recently attending in Washington. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, institution and very, very quality focused. Dr. Mate is also the President of the Lucian Leap Institute and a member of the faculty at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Mate's scholarly work has focused on healthcare quality, strategies for achieving large-scale change, and approaches to improving health equity and value. Previously, Dr. Mate worked in Partners in Health, the World Health Organization, Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as serving as the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's Chief Innovation and Education Officer. Dr. Mate is widely published serves on multiple health, um, health systems and healthcare technology boards, and has received multiple honors, including serving as a Soros Fellow, a Fulbright Specialist, and an Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellow. He graduated from Brown University with a degree in American history and from Harvard Medical School with a medical degree. It is our very great pleasure to now welcome Dr. Keda Mate. Well, thank you so much. Let me first check that you can hear me okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Turn again. Very good. I think we can. I think sounds good. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, let me just say thank you to all of you. Um, it's a real uh, privilege and an honor to be uh, with you today. Uh, Gail mentioned my time at, at Harvard Medical School. That was a, a time when I had a chance to visit McLean uh, Hospital on a, on a behavioral health rotation uh, uh, so I've had a chance to visit uh, the hospital at one point in, in the now what feels like the remote past, but I, I hope to have a chance to see you all again at some point in the near future. And Ed, thank you so much for the for the work that you've done and led over many years um, throughout the, both at McLean uh, as well as at an institution that I uh, hold dear 
at MGB and partners uh, where I trained and spent many, many years of my early career. So it's a great privilege to be to, to hear you and to have the opportunity to to speak today uh, in a lecture that honors uh, that honors you. So thank you very much for your many contributions to quality and safety throughout our uh, throughout the world, really, but uh, specifically in the institutions that were mentioned earlier. So thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, let me just say, uh, you know, I had want to start our conversation today uh, with a story uh, of a patient of mine um, who I met many, many years ago in uh, Providence, uh, Rhode Island. I, I first met Gloria uh, she was when she was in her mid-40s. Uh, she was a Dominican-born single mother. Uh, I met her before I became a physician uh, when I was working as a community health worker uh, at Providence's Miriam Hospital. Uh, Gloria had been diagnosed with HIV um, and AIDS, and for the first few months of all of us at the Miriam knowing her, she was desperately sick. She had a very fragile immune system. Uh, she was on the teetering on the edge of um, uh, death. Uh, her physicians at the time made a deal with her. They would give her a cocktail of medications that would likely save her life, but she would have to take these medications under supervision. They didn't uh, trust her, you see, to take these powerful antiretroviral medications on her own. Uh, instead, the Gloria's doctors wanted to make sure she was taking these medications, and I was assigned to her to be the supervisor of her taking these medications. As you, as you might imagine, this was in the uh, early 90s, uh, 1994 or so, 1993, 1994, just as we had started to discover some of the medications that would be valuable to treating HIV. Uh, Gloria desperately wanted these new drugs. Um, she needed them. For her, they were literally the difference between life and death. And with very limited resources and very few options, uh, Gloria agreed to the program and agreed to welcoming me into her home as a supervisor. I, I began to see Gloria every day uh, for her morning dose of medications. And I remember, uh, mostly remember that time walking into her home in a rundown part of Providence, Rhode Island, uh, with her four young children surging from the small house in which she lived in various states of, of dress, getting ready for her school. And Gloria often sitting in the kitchen or standing in the kitchen, I should say, uh, at, the, at the stove, dishing out eggs and cereal and, and toast and whatever uh, she could find basically to uh, help the kids uh, get ready for, for school. Sometimes I'd pitch in, I'd, I'd be coming to her home ready to help her with her medicines. But first things first, we had to get her kids out of the school, uh, out on time to get to the school bus. Um, so I'd help often uh, getting backpacks on, tying shoelaces, shoving a last piece of toast at them as they were running out the door. I was uh, almost surely an irritation to Gloria. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, so I tried my best to be helpful to her as much as she, uh, as much as I could. And I think she tolerated me uh, with a sense of compassion and at least good humor. I was doing a job, of course, and she was doing her job. After her kids left, uh, we'd sit at her kitchen table uh, covered in uh, a plastic uh, tablecloth. I, I still remember it to this day. And uh, she'd open up her pillbox um, and she would be taking uh, something on the order of 23 pills. I remember this very clearly. She'd take 23 pills out from the first uh, effort, uh, from, the, from the first container and she would gulp them down in, in three handfuls. And I remember this so vividly now uh, because uh, Gloria was wasted by her infection and her face and her skin was uh, taut around her face and her facial bones. And it was very weathered uh, by the infection that she was uh, bearing. And it was actually quite difficult to watch her wince with pain as she uh, gulped down these medications with every, uh, with every, uh, in, in three handfuls, but we did our work. We did our, our jobs. I, uh, supervised as she took her pills. I supervised and documented that she was taking them and she took down her medications as, as uh, planned. Gloria, of course, was really afraid of her disease and what might happen to her and her family and her children. If she couldn't complete the task, if she couldn't go on, on occasions in slightly quieter moments, she would ask me what I knew about HIV, and I'd tell her exactly what I understood and the science as I understood it at that time. 
And she would tell me that she was afraid that her employer would find out about her clinical condition and that she would lose the job that was keeping her family afloat. One day, I had a chance to walk with Gloria to her bus stop um, after the morning pill ritual. And she asked me why the hospital was sending me out to see her. Um, And I tried to think of a good way, a polite way to answer. But at that moment, standing at the bus stop, waiting for the bus to come, I decided to level with her, to tell her the truth, um, again, as least as I understood it. I said to her, I'm here because the doctors at the hospital think you are high risk. They think you're at high risk of not taking your medicines, and they believe you might develop resistance and fail those medicines if you don't take them. They don't trust you to do this on your own. My role in the health system at that time was an extension of a system that didn't really believe in Gloria, that didn't trust her. And of course, Gloria already knew this, uh, but, uh, but she wanted to see how much I had understood yet about what role I was playing. The truth was that because of the way the system was treating her, Gloria didn't much trust the system either. Gloria had developed a severe HIV infection in the years right after we had made amazing discoveries in HIV treatment that some of you will remember. It was not quite curative as it is today, but the the three drug combinations that we were using by the time I met Gloria had the amazing ability to save people from the brink of death and convert a life threatening acute infectious disease into a chronic lifelong ailment as we now understand HIV to be in many instances. But despite these miraculous medications, many of the patients that I saw in the clinic and that we saw in the hospital didn't survive. And I think it's because we didn't trust them and ultimately because they didn't trust us. During the pandemic, I thought about Gloria a lot. I I saw evidence all over our healthcare system of a plummeting confidence in science, um, in leadership, I'm sure many of you saw trust fraying, not only in our health systems, but in so many aspects of our lives. I saw our scientists and researchers in turn grow frustrated and lose confidence in our patients and whole communities. Distrust and disinformation seem to be blossoming anew, but the truth is that it has been with us for a very long time, in fact. For over four decades, uh, since I started looking into this, I I discovered a lot of uh, evidence that trust has been declining for decades. Uh, For decades now, for four decades, the polling organization Gallup uh, has surveyed the public, the American public, about our confidence and trust in 14 leading American institutions, the media, government, military, medicine. The data are striking year over year, we lose more and more trust in our institutions. On the left here of this slide is uh, our confidence and trust in the the media. On the right, our trust in religious institutions. Uh, Trust has fallen to historic lows across almost every major American institution. Religion has fallen from a peak of 68% trust to 36% today. In 1979, the majority of Americans trusted the media. Today, less than a third do. And a 2020 Pew study found that only 20% of Americans trust the federal government always or most of the time. As a nation, we have less faith in medicine than we once did. Trust in healthcare was 80% in 1973. And in 2016, it was less than 40%. During the pandemic, trust in the medical systems, uh, you'll remember people were uh, celebrating healthcare workers, many of many of you, many of us, uh, trust surged back to 51%, the highest level seen since 1977. But by the early part of 2021, confidence had again eroded, tumbling trust back to the low 30s. All over the world, trust in our once venerated institutions is declining. Trust in leadership has been declining. And I think most harmful of all, or most pernicious of all, is that we increasingly trust one another less and less and less as we have retreated into, I think, social media fueled echo chambers where our prior beliefs are confirmed by other 
communities who are like-minded, eager to shame and blame the other side, on the other hand, instead of entering into some kind of considered uh, dialogue or discourse. In the, during the pandemic, I, I remember in my hometown, uh, I went into the grocery store and at, at one point in the evening, I saw the same grocery store on the news. And when masking decisions, as you walk into your neighborhood grocery store, become ideological statements about your politics, uh, we have to imagine that suspicion and distrust between neighbors will inevitably rise and trust takes a nosedive. Pick up literally any newspaper these days and you will read headlines filled with evidence in American society of a fragile and crumbling trust. Within our health systems over the past few years, we've seen consequences of this eroding trust, I would say, every day, from challenging conversations about the value and importance of vaccines to the tsunami of misinformation and deliberate disinformation that has flooded our media feeds, to the flagging morale and challenges of our healthcare workers. We have seen trust between our systems and our patients declining, and consequently trust between our clinicians and our systems is faltering. Gloria, my patient back in the day, might have predicted some of this. She would have said, if you sow the seeds of distrust, beware of the harvest. I now want to introduce you to a second character in the story that I want to tell you today, and that's uh, Claudia Finkelstein. Claudia is uh, now a friend, uh, but when I first met Claudia, I didn't know her. She was an internist, a geriatrician, a medical educator, and an administrator at the University of Washington in Seattle. About a year ago now, uh, Don Berwick, the founder of the IHI, where I, where the, the institution that I now lead, Don and I received a note from Claudia, and her note started uh, ominously with the sentence that you see here on the slide. Her note said, Tuesday at a podium in a small auditorium, I realized my time was finally up. I want to just read to you for a moment um, a bit about uh, a bit of her note. Um, excuse me, sorry for a second. This went backwards. Early on, Claudia wrote, my work's purpose, meaning, and love were easy to access. The rewards easily outweighed the inevitable stresses of the job. The ability to connect deeply to alleviate suffering in both patients and trainees was more than adequate compensation for the difficulties of the work itself. Claudia writes, I was sure my patients could tell that I cared about them and for them, but somewhere along the way, something changed, something shifted irreversibly. I didn't notice when the indifference started to crowd out the love and joy for my work, but now there is no mistaking it. Claudia went on. She said, what had happened? I'm not sure. Some nature, some nurture. The political, societal, and economic changes to how we provide care were part of it. But increasingly, she wrote, my inability to address social inequities as the root causes of many primary care visits created moral distress and a sense of powerlessness. I felt like I was peddling amlodipine and Prozac to people who needed a proper living wage and an equal playing field. It became more and more difficult to believe that I was actually helping people. It may be, Claudia concluded, that I have not been up to the task of making things better. It may be that I no longer relish connecting to individual trainees or patients, or maybe I have just run out of compassion and steam. Claudia's letter ended as abruptly as it started. Her note to Don and I ended quite abruptly. And I remember reading that note the first time. In, in medicine, as all of you know, we're trained to look for cries for help. Uh, and this, I felt, was a cry for help. No doubt about it. But it wasn't just from Claudia. It felt like a cry for help from the healing professions as a whole. Thinking back to Claudia's letter, I kept coming back to one particular sentence in her note. This one that's on the screen right now, my inability to address social inequities created her sense of moral distress and the sense of powerlessness that she felt. Back in the 1980s, ethicist Andrew Jameson described the pressures on the nursing profession as the same kind of powerless, with the same words of powerlessness. He helped frame an important set of distinctions between moral uncertainty, 
where the moral course of action is unknown, moral dilemmas, where a choice is present between two or more ethically justifiable actions, and what he called moral distress, where nurses were asked to do things that went fundamentally against their conscience. What he wrote was that when multiple moments of this kind of moral distress stacked up one on top of another, they could result in what he called permanent and lasting moral injuries. Reading Claudia's note reminded me of discussions I had had with my wife, who is a palliative care doctor and an infectious disease doctor and a hospital ethicist. We never thought that all three of her talents would ever be put to simultaneous use, but during the pandemic, that's exactly what happened. People were dying horrific deaths from an infectious disease that every day was presenting hospitals and hospital leadership with ethical challenges. In those early months, we would talk about the almost bizarre choices she was asking her colleagues to make, impossible choices about who to give ICU beds to, how to divvy up ventilators, what care should be permanently put on hold, who should re receive the scarce PPE that we had available. Ultimately, she, like Claudia, had challenges resolving these impossible choices. These choices felt, I think for many of us, as if they were new during the pandemic, and yet they were also very familiar. For years, we've make, I would argue we've been making these kinds of choices in healthcare across the United States, and maybe even in the world. Every day in hospitals everywhere, we are forced to board mental health patients in emergency departments for days on end. We place our older patients in decaying care homes that are understaffed and under-resourced. We allow our unconscious biases to under-treat pain and hemorrhage in our black and indigenous mothers. We force our poorest and most vulnerable to travel the longest distances because there isn't quality healthcare in their communities. These challenges were not made by the pandemic actually. We've been making these kinds of choices all along. And while these weaknesses have been chronicled by many, what perhaps has been less well understood was that the pandemic finally allowed us to see the fragility and vulnerability of our caring enterprise and all of us who are inside of it itself. Now, there's a lot written about burnout um, these days. I'm sure this is a topic that's come up more than once in, in, in your efforts at McLean. Uh, but just for context for a moment, you just to review some of that context, global surveys suggest that one in three clinicians are considering leaving their jobs within the next couple of years, with as many as a quarter wanting out of healthcare entirely. In the US, one in five healthcare workers changed jobs during the pandemic, and two in five nurses have suggested their intent to leave the workforce within the next 12 to 18 months. Organizations have invested in wellness programs, efforts to bolster resilience. Early programs, as many of you will remember, focused on yoga, personal restoration, exercise schemes, mindfulness, sometimes plying staff with food and, and, uh, and uh, other such uh, benefits. More mature programs have offered mental health services and supports, increases in pay, more time to execute non-clinical tasks. None of these efforts is necessarily bad or wrong or misguided but I would argue that the pressures on our systems and on our staff are too great. And these fixes, although helpful, still remain too superficial. What's more, I think these efforts fundamentally miss the actual diagnosis. Uh, in a survey of over 5,000 clinicians in, the, in 2020, Colin West and his colleagues from the Mayo Clinic found that physicians and nurses don't lack resilience. In fact, in general, they were more resilient than the overall public. Oops, hold on a second. Here's the, here's the data here, that they're more resilient than their overall public. And, and, and yet, despite that resilience, our colleagues were and often are experiencing unprecedented rates of burnout. So what exactly is really going on here? The problem isn't the resilience of our healthcare workers. The problem is the system in which we are asked to work. So I, I started asking uh, this question as to what might be the sources and causes of the kind of moral distress that is leading to the burnout that we're experiencing in our organizations. And I met someone that some of you may be familiar with, Dr. Wendy Dean. 
Uh, Dr. Dean is a psychiatrist and a surgeon uh, here in the Boston metro area who's worked for many years with army veterans and survivors of conflict zones. And she founded an organization not long ago called Fixed Moral Injury, which is focused on trying to help bring lessons of how to work through moral injury to health healthcare workers. Wendy says, there are a lot of roads that lead to burnout, but the highway to that burnout is moral injury. It's in the very structure of how our systems are built. I had a recent, now probably about six to eight months ago, conversation with Wendy, and she said to me, training individual resilience assumes individual frailty, but moral injury is not an individual problem. It's a systems problem. We need to fix the whole system. To use an analogy, Wendy said, we have a healthcare workforce full of high performance Lamborghinis. We ask them to go out on the roads full of potholes and fallen trees. Wendy said, to let the Lamborghinis perform to their full potential, we have to fix the potholes and clear the fallen trees. So how do we do that? I asked her. Here, I think Claudia's letter offers us a possible clue. She wrote once again, my inability to address social inequities created moral distress and a sense of powerlessness. It reminded me of the powerlessness that I had on the city street where Gloria had asked me why the system didn't trust her. Why does this matter? So what if trust is on the decline? So what if there is so much powerlessness on either side of the bedside? 50 years ago, the health economist Victor Fuchs noted that there were two kinds of businesses, those that produce goods, products, and consumables, and those that produce services, interactions, and experiences. Victor Fuchs, Professor Fuchs said, in the former, control of how we create value is almost entirely in the hands of the producer. If the manufacturer adds more bells and whistles that people like to a product, you can charge more for it. So for example, if you have a car, say a Toyota, and you make the Toyota go faster or use less gas or drive itself or be, become electric, you can charge more for it. But value in service-oriented businesses, Professor Fuchs said, is not created by the manufacturer. It is co-produced with the end user, the participant in the activity. In our case, the experience is co-produced with the patient. In other words, value in service industries is born of an interaction. It is the interaction itself that is the product. And the interaction is driven by two or more people in a relationship. In a healthcare encounter, it's between typically between a clinician and a patient. And the relationship, those relationships, any service industry-based relationship depends on trust. Trust oils the machinery of relationship. It allows us to understand the context and live realities of our patients. Trust matters so much that I increasingly believe it determines not only how we experience care and caregiving, but trust determines whether we actually get to real health outcomes. So let me give, for a moment, let me explain what I mean by trust as a determinant of health. There's a lot written about social determinants of health. My uh, good friend and colleague at the National Academies, Michael McGinnis, and his colleagues famously popularized the notion that most of our health outcome is not determined by what we do in hospitals or in our clinics, but by our behaviors, our social conditions, and our genetic determinants. But in many ways, all of those, I would argue, are in turn determined by trust. We take advice on who and how to behave uh, from those that we trust, whether to exercise, whether to eat a new diet, whether we should engage in a mindfulness effort. A trusted messenger is at least as important, I would argue, as the message itself. If you don't believe me, have a look at, have a look at these data. These are researchers looking at survey data from respondents from 10 different countries from around the world. They found evidence that trust is a direct contributor to health creating behaviors. In this study, this was a study done during the pandemic. In this study, people who trusted the health system were far more likely, 21% more likely to be vaccinated against COVID than those that did not trust the health system. Having trust is a more significant driver of being vaccinated 
than income or relative quality of available services. Trust determines whether someone seeks preventative care more than income, age, or education. And trust can lessen the socioeconomic inequities that determine whether someone gets preventative care. People with lower incomes who trust their healthcare systems and their healthcare providers are more likely to get preventive care than their wealthier counterparts. In other words, trust is simultaneously a major challenge in healthcare, and it seems it can be an essential tool to creating even more health and health-seeking behaviors. In many ways, trust determines the very determinants which in turn shape our health today and tomorrow. So having established that, I, I hope, convinced you to a degree that trust matters, how do we actually do something about it? So as I started to dig into this, I came across the fascinating work of a lecturer from the UK, Rachel Botsman, and a book that she wrote called, Who Can You Trust? Botsman cites all the usual statistics that I shared with you earlier about how trust has been declining in our institutions and in our societies, but she reaches actually a very different conclusion. Trust, Botsman writes, the glue that holds our society together hasn't disappeared. It has simply shifted. Consider the following example. Who among you listening uh, on the audience today uh, would have believed me if I told you 15 years ago, try to remember what it was like 15 years ago. It's kind of hard to imagine. We didn't even have iPhones then. Uh, but 15 years ago, if I had asked you to imagine this scenario, you would someday fly to a city you've never been to before. You will then hail a car of a perfect stranger, private car of a perfect stranger, through an app. And that perfect stranger would take you to an empty house of another perfect stranger that you booked through a different app. And there you'll spend the week, next week, vacationing or working or whatever you're doing there, all the while trusting that a decentralized network of local actors is going to keep you safe and free from harm throughout your journey. This was unimaginable, unimaginable just a few years ago. And yet today, millions of people trust decentralized networks of local actors to guide us on everything we hold dear, from what we eat, to where we sleep, to where we should buy our next pair of shoes to who the best cardiologist might be in our town. Botsman's contention is that we haven't lost trust, nor have we forgotten how to trust, but rather she believes that trust today is simply different than it was before. We may no longer trust institutions, centralized powers, and traditional forms of leadership. Instead, we seem to trust networks increasingly decentralized where anyone can be an author. Gloria, my patient, might come to trust me, Kadar, the individual, and our network of community health workers while maintaining a healthy distrust of organized medicine or the hospital that I was sent from. So if trust is evolving, how do we in healthcare harness this new network form of trust? How do we build communities of trust that might prove restorative, not only to patients like Gloria, but also to providers like Claudia. As I dug into this question, I learned about a whole field of work, really, that I, I hadn't known existed before. Sociologists, psychologists, behaviorists, business leaders who have been studying trust in organizations and soci societies for some time. I found the work specifically of Frances Frey, um, whose work I would commend to all of you. She's a Harvard Business School professor, and who worked for Uber and some years ago, maybe five or six years ago, you may recall that Uber had a big problem with toxic work culture. It led to the, the, the firing of the CEO uh, of Uber. And when Uber's toxic, distrustful work culture was uh, falling apart, they uh, called Francis for help. Francis's model of trust is built on three essential ingredients, three components empathy, logic, and authenticity. If you believe that my empathy is directed towards you, you are more likely to trust me. If you believe my reasoning makes logical sense, you will be more likely to trust me. And if you believe that I am being my true authentic self, then you are much more likely to trust me. These three things, empathy, logic, authenticity, are both where trust can begin and where it can also break down. So how do you actually practice these things? What can we do in healthcare to build trust 
restore the relationships amongst ourselves and cultivate those network communities that might sustain people like Gloria and Claudia for decades to come. Frey says the usual thinking about empathy is that we must walk a mile in another person's shoes. But of course, it's almost impossible for me to do this because I can't really know what it's like to walk in your shoes uh, from where I sit and from my experience. The breakthrough in empathy is this idea of centering someone else, choosing to spend time with another person, putting that person in the center of your attention, genuinely getting curious about what their experience is and has been. And I can't walk in your shoes perhaps, but I can center you, pay attention to you, learn from your experience. Uh, and then I can ask you uh, open, honest questions about what matters to you. A wise colleague of mine said, once people don't care what you know until they know that you care. The second component of phrase trust triangle was logic. I won't trust what I can't understand. It's hard to believe in someone whose judgment you don't trust fundamentally, whose ability you doubt, um, and who you don't feel you can connect to and you can communicate with. We trust people who demonstrate their capability, their expertise. We trust people whose knowledge, who are knowledgeable. Uh, but with that, but with knowledge alone is not enough either. You've got to communicate more effectively. To solve for that communication challenge, Frey says, shoulders, eyes, and question marks, by which she means sit down with the person, make eye contact, put aside distractions, ask open and honest questions, and importantly, care about the answer. How, that's how to communicate about trust, and that's how to communicate in a way that will build trust. The last dimension of phrase trust triangle is actually my favorite one, and it's about authenticity. You cannot be good at being anyone but yourself, and it's hard to trust someone who isn't being their authentic self. Without being authentically you, trust will necessarily weaken. Skepticism about intention and motivation often would creep in. There's a simple diagnostic that Frey suggests. Is the person that you are at work different from the person you are at home? If the answer is yes, uh, or maybe, the authenticity part of the trust triangle, of your trust triangle, is probably weaker than it could be. In survey after survey, what people want from leaders is consistency and follow through. Tell people where you're going, take them there, and then show them where you've taken them. Trust isn't built overnight, of course. You've got to listen, really understand, act on what you're hearing, share what you're act, share how you're acting, and then do that over and over and over again. And perhaps after the tenth time of doing that, people will begin to trust that you mean what you say and you say what you mean. As I learned about uh, this uh, this this notion of trust and Frey's trust triangle, I came across a, a somewhat unusual story that uh, for some reason has stuck with me for for now over a year. Uh, the story was of a woman uh, who was driving her car down a backcountry road in Australia. She came to a turn in the road where her son had been tragically uh, killed in a car accident just in one year before she came upon that location. The memory, the, the, the geography and the location, the memory caused an immediate panic attack in the, in, in the woman. And she pulled her car over to the side of the road and she couldn't continue on. She couldn't drive onwards. She picked up her phone at that point and she dialed not her husband, not a close friend, not the police or the ambulance service, but the National Roadways and Motorists Association. This struck me when I read it as totally bizarre. But here's what happened. The NRMA, the National Roads and Motorists Association, the kind of the equivalent to the AAA, the AAA of Australia dispatched someone to come see her, and that person got to her within three minutes. And then the NRMA worker proceeded to sit in her car with her for the next two hours, holding her hand, listening to music that reminded her of her son, talking to her to ease her panic until she was ready to get safely on her way. She didn't have to get her car towed. She didn't need to go to the emergency room. She didn't need a pill for her panic attack. She just needed someone to take the time to be there with her. And sure, there probably was a quicker way, a more expedient way, uh, but this would have led to expenseful, expensive, wasteful, you know, potentially more expedient solutions instead of getting her what she actually needed to help her heal. 
And when she was asked why she had called the Motorist Association of all, of all agencies instead of her family or friends, she said, quite simply, because I knew they would come and I knew they would care. To me, that was empathy, not just at the individual level, that's empathy at the whole organizational level. That's a logical, consistent service. That is, authentic, that is authenticity. That's giving someone exactly what they need, when and how they need it. And that, to me, is the embodiment of trust. The presence of trust can create successful improvements in healthcare, and its absence can be absolutely toxic to healthcare. One of the best examples that I've found of how trust can enable better care came from one of IHI's closest partners, the South Central Foundation in Alaska. When a vaccine became available for COVID back in early 21, I would regularly follow the data on who was getting vaccines delivered and distributed successfully in their community. If you remember that time, the New York Times would publish data on which states were distributing the vaccines the fastest. And I would, as a, as a data nerd, I would spend time looking at, at that, the league tables, if you will. And for a period of time in the earliest days, January, February, March of 2021, Alaska of all states was leading the league tables for the fastest vaccinating state in the country. Alaska, as many of you will know, is vast and empty, and it's really difficult terrain in January or February. So I was completely puzzled by how Alaska was achieving this remarkable rate of vaccination uh, in a difficult state to achieve that in. So I called one of our friends um, at IHI, one of our best uh, longstanding allies, uh, Dr. Doug Eby, that's him there on the left. Doug has been the chief medical officer for South Central Foundation's Nuka Health System for decades. Nuka prides itself on being customer owned, as they call it, customer owned and operated, driven by the Alaska native community. And what Doug told me did not surprise me. South Central Foundation, this health system that he worked for, had developed a vaccine distribution system based on trust and partnership with the community. To understand what they did, first you have to understand that South Central has been operating the Nuka health system for decades an authentic relationship with the Alaska Native community. It had well-developed community councils that guided Doug and his colleagues through every stage of the pandemic response. And when it came time for the vaccine to be distributed, the Alaska Native councils told Doug and his colleagues to begin with the elderly and the most vulnerable first. They recommended that clinicians from the health system go to speak with those elders about their needs. So that's exactly what they did. Doug and his colleagues and his team went to see the elders, the Alaska native elders, and they learned from them that the elders would not be able to come to the clinic to receive those vaccines. The clinic and the vaccines would have to go to them. So Doug and his team took, it, took, took on this design challenge and they built a comprehensive delivery system. As the title of this New York Times article documents, they used seaplanes, boats, snowmobiles, all kinds of different forms of transportation to reach older Alaska natives wherever they were. And having done this, those elders served as ambassadors and master communicators about the vaccine for the entire system. They helped South Central communicate the value and the benefits of getting vaccinated and many more followed. And what made this special was that by designing for the most vulnerable and the hardest to reach, South Central had built a logical system that could reach everyone else. And that is why for a period of time in early 2021, the area that South Central served was the fastest vaccinating region in the fastest vaccinating state in the entire country. And it was all built on understanding, authentic relationship and a logical design. It was all fundamentally built on trust. Empathy, logic and authenticity. I think this is the trust triangle that we can all remember and we can use to interrupt the downward spiral of distrust that's been growing in healthcare all over the world. We no doubt have much more to learn about trust uh, and to understand how it determines our health. But I'm confident more today than ever before that to improve health, we have to build trust. And I believe that we can begin to build trust right now, not by next Tuesday, but this afternoon, and not just with your patients, but with your colleagues and your families and your friends, and not just with people you know best, but with whoever 
is sitting next to you right now listening to this uh, at your computer. Remember what Francis Frey said about how to build trust, shoulders, eyes, and question marks, by which he meant sit down, make eye contact, put aside distractions, ask questions, and care about the answers. This is the essence to building trust. Sit, see, put away the phone or pager, ask questions, and care about what people are telling us. And the trick is to do this exact thing when you least want to do it. When your patient is angry, when you're hurrying from one place to the next, when time is against you, or when you're most exhausted. This is precisely when I would argue it's important or most important for us to sit, take a deep breath, make eye contact, and ask what matters. It's easy to say, and I know a very hard thing to do. For our institutions, for our health systems, there's an equivalent. Sit down, get out into the community, share a meal, sit and eat and talk. Go to the elders as Doug did in Alaska. In the quality world, we talk a lot about getting to the Gemba or the front lines of care. If you believe the notion that health is now made at home, then the front lines of care and creating health were never our wards, ICUs, or clinics. They were in fact the kitchen tables where I met Gloria every morning for many, many months. Getting to the Gemba now means getting into the community going to Gloria's kitchen table. Go there with empathy, center the needs of the people you find, including your staff and their families. Get curious and get ready to learn and be taught. Go to the Gemba, ask honest and open questions about what matters, be interested in the answer. And when you go, be prepared to act differently, to design completely different solutions. Recently, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and IHI started a new learning community. There are eight health systems in it right now who are trying to apply the lessons uh, from the trust triangle and from the healing art to building trust and a very different kind of trust within their communities and with their staff. For more than 20 years now, I've, I've thought about that moment at the bus stop with Gloria, where we began to do something different, where we stood for a moment at least, shoulder to shoulder, locked eyes, and decided to tell each other the truth. That was the moment where we made the conscious choice to believe in one another, to trust one another. And we built our first, I think, truly trusting moment. It was also the first moment in my early career where I remember building trust with a patient. I will never know if that moment had anything to do with Gloria's, uh, with Gloria's success. Truthfully, she was an amazing patient. She was even better mother. And if I'm honest, a truly wonderful mentor to me. The first of a long line of patients who have been my truest and best teachers but among, and among her many lessons uh, to me was that no matter how deep and long lasting the legacy of distrust, you can always start today to build a different kind of story. You can always take that first step to rebuilding trust in any relationship. And when it has been restored, this kind of abiding trust can be, I think, the most powerful partner to pursuing better health. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today. And I'm, I'm happy if time allows to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Monte, I wish you could hear the applause. Unfortunately on Zoom you can, but what a wonderful and inspiring lecture. You certainly gave us a roadmap during these dark and chaotic times. I just wanna remind folks that if you have a question, please uh, put your question under the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So Dr. Monte, I'm just gonna to read to you. We've got three questions, all right? So I'll read them to you. Sure. We'll start with this one here. With your technology example, is this really a matter of trust or a matter of survival? A person cannot optimally function in society absent technology. Yeah, I think, you know, technologies, uh, these, these days, uh, many technologies have become critical to our, to our effort, whether it's life or healthcare. Uh, technologies have always been part of what we uh, regard as important. I would just say that, you know, in order for us to uh, use technologies to their best advantage uh, requires developing relationship, developing the kind of trust that I'm talking about. You know, the, the, whether it's a technology that's on a digital device like an iPhone or whether it's a new antiretroviral like we were talking about earlier with my patient, with Gloria, in all cases, these are, techn these are technical developments and to enable their best use and to enable their, uh, the ability for them to achieve the, the best health potential for our patients, we have to build a strong and lasting relationship. That uh, I would say that 
there is no way that a technology transforms care uh, without the kind of relationship that is foundational to the, the, the transaction of healthcare every day. Thank you. Next question. Thank you very much for your presentation. How can healthcare organizations as a whole build trust with un underserved, underrepresented populations, particularly with the increasingly limited resources that are now available? Yeah, I kind of I started to address this question towards the end of the the talk. Obviously, you yeah. know, getting getting into the field, um, sitting with your community, really trying to understand deeply what those communities want and need. Uh, making sure that we convey it in the manner in which they want to need it, right? The Alaska example, getting to Alaska native elders, that's not how Doug and South Central Foundation would have designed their vaccine delivery program. Had they not had the courage to ask the Alaska native elders how to do it, uh, they would not have been able, they wouldn't have designed it that way. So critical to this is, is, is getting out and asking those kinds of questions. I will add one other, um, uh, one other notion. Uh, particularly for communities that have been historically, as, as the person is describing, underserved or underrepresented, underrepresented, which often are, are, are populations that are uh, more socioeconomically vulnerable, often racial minorities, um, sometimes uh, uh, indigenous populations. Uh, there, there's almost always a history of something that has transpired often, between, not necessarily with the institution in that community, but in the broader sense with that population. And there it matters how the organization approaches that community. So if you approach that community with a, uh, the ability to acknowledge that history um, and uh, to uh, acknowledge the often harmful actions of the enterprise um, in that community, it makes an enormous difference uh, just think about every truth and reconciliation community you've ever heard of, whether it's in the Rwandan genocide or in Nazi Germany, they always start, or in apartheid South Africa, they always start with an acknowledgement of how harm has transpired, how injury has taken place in that community. That acknowledgement, without that acknowledgement, if you move straight to solution finding uh, and trying to repair the, the, the history uh, without the acknowledgement of prior, prior injury and harm, uh, it becomes difficult for the the individuals in the underrepresented communities or populations to believe that in it, that the uh, that the entity that the organization is serious about uh, casting a different path. So that kind of initial acknowledgement, I think, is really vital for delivery organizations and others uh, to uh, to admit to before you get into solution finding. Uh, we have a, a, a health equity a set of health equity initiatives that we call pursuing equity. And uh, of course they turn eventually to uh, improving, you know, stroke care rates and hypertension management and cancer screening and trying to rectify the specific inequities that are uh, happening to particular populations. But they always start, every single delivery organization that's part of a pursuing equity effort starts with an acknowledgement of their own history and what we call a getting grounded phase in which they study actually the organization's legacy in the community. And it's always revealing the stories that they understand and they learn about, you know, who's funded it, how did the organization get started, uh, how has leadership been structured in the organization for decades. When you walk the leadership hallways, do they reflect the makeup of your community? It's that kind of thing that uh, teaches us a lot and allows us to uh, actually come to the community with a better appreciation of why the community might not trust the institution for, uh, to begin with. Thank you. And then last question here. Amazing talk. Thank you so much. Do you believe different people weigh different parts of the trust triangle differently? If so, does that mean we focus our energy on specific parts for specific people? Or would that lead to inconsistencies for everyone? Yeah, you know, uh, thanks for the question, Josh. I, I, you know, I don't know if there's evidence to suggest that one matters more than the other. You know that each of these, uh, you know, you know, phrase conception of it at least, and you know, her this is her theory as to what drives trust, and we've now been using this with multiple health systems, as I as I mentioned with the American Board of Internal Medicine, but the you know, it's a, it, to to us so far it's been all or none. It's hard to imagine that you would weight them differently or that empathy would matter more than the other two or otherwise. Again, if you have a very empathetic connection without a very logical conclusion, 
you know, it, it may, it, it's unlikely to build a kind of consistent trust. You can be your authentic self and be absolutely not particularly empathetic, right? So if you weight one of them, if you overweight one of them um, and don't do the others, I, it's hard for me to imagine uh, trust being uh, uh, as well developed or built. So from my perspective, the all three matter. Uh, I've seen or heard people try to add things to this, um, the triangle. I'm not sure that there's additional parts that are necessary, but from my perspective, all three of these um, are equivalently weighted. And I haven't seen people weigh them differently or consider them differently um, on the receiving end either. Thank you. So uh, we've got two more questions and I'm sorry, that's all we're gonna have time. Two more questions and <laughs> Dr. Macho, we could keep you here forever, I'm telling you. Okay, here's another one. Great presentation. You mentioned that interpersonal trust is eroding in our generation. Do you think it's an intentional or unintentional side effect of growth? Uh, I don't know what the uh, uh, asker means by growth. Um, I don't know if that's economic growth or some other kind of growth that we're talking about. I don't think anybody intends for a decline in, in interpersonal trust. So I don't think we're trying as a society to create less interpersonal trust. I think that's an effect, uh, a, you know, a consequence of what I described in the talk of, of essentially um, the fact that I think it's increasingly possible for us to never meet someone who disagrees with us. Uh, because we can retreat into uh, our our social spheres that are uh, that are designated often by a political perspective or view, um, and rarely the two need to meet. Um, social media has allowed us to retreat into echo chambers where we confirm our prior beliefs and never engage the other side except to demonize them. Uh, and I think that is a massive problem or crisis. I would argue. Uh, civility and the ability to interact um, in new and different ways. Discourse, I, I fear, is, is, is fragile. There, there's actually a, a, a concept called the Overton window. Some of you will be familiar with this. It's the, it's the space in the middle where conservative and liberal voices could come together and find a middle ground. Increasingly, there, there's a discussion about two separate Overton windows, a safe space for, for the left, a safe space for the right. And should you stray from the uh, safe space on the right, uh, if you're on the right, then you can get attacked not only by the left, but also by other people on the right and likewise on the left. And, and that kind of thing is just the polar. That's that's what people mean by polarization. And I think that is not necessarily intentional, but is is definitely something that is uh, coming into play at this point in time. Thank you. And last question from our CMO. Hello, Mr. Lawrence. You have inspired all of us in this great lecture by Dr. Mate. Question for Dr. Mate. What are the best ways to nurture the trust of our patients and families who arrive here from ERs or EDs, <laughs> uh, perhaps unfamiliar with McLean after a long and stressful pandemic? Yeah. Well, I think there's a there's a uh, I showed in one of the slides, uh, uh, Dr. Gold, uh, a a picture of a trustworthiness change package uh, that IHI has created. I can make sure that Gail, we get a copy of it to you. Thank you. But within that change package, and this is what we're testing with the ABIM uh, Foundation and the eight health systems that we're working on this with. But we're we're now testing a set of strategies to try to build trusting relationships with patients, families, and communities. Um, and I, there's a number of uh, really interesting ideas, both about how to create more empathy, how to build more logical service, how to create a more authentic relationship with our communities that uh, I think will be part of the answer to the question that you're you're asking here about how to how to reinvigorate a trusting relationship with our with our patients after a time where, uh, as you rightly say, uh, people have uh, not. A, I think there's a lot of bifurcation here. I think some people see what we've done during the pandemic as being uh, uh, as being heroic. As, as many people have said, as well as a, a source of distrust. So there's an opportunity, I think, ahead of us. And I'll make sure to get that that uh, change package to you, Gail. And thank you. And you feel free to spread it around the, the system. And Dr. Mate, somebody just wrote, do you have time just for one more? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you for a fantastic lecture. Any tips on increasing empathy for those whom it is a mismatch with their authentic self. And that really is the last one. Uh, fair, very good. Well, no, I look, I, I, I 
I think empathy, my, my wife is a, I mentioned this earlier, my wife's a palliative care doc, right? And I did not see myself as a particularly empathetic person. I will, I will readily admit to you. And I think she would have said the same when she first met me. Uh, but I've learned that empathy is a learned skill. It's not something you're born with necessarily alone. I, I suspect that many of you at McLean will know that already. There are certainly people that are better at it than others, uh, but you can learn how to become a more empathetic person. And, and a lot of it has to do with listening um, and not presuming that you know the answers. Um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, asking those kinds of open and honest questions that I described earlier uh, and really training yourself to not respond kind of in the immediate, uh, in the immediate as somebody is, is answering. You're not conceptualizing your own answer to the question that you've just asked. So uh, there's a lot that one can do on, on actually building the skills for empathy um, over time and uh, just recognizing that there is there, you know, empathy itself is a learned, uh, is a, uh, there's an opportunity to learn the skill. Thank you so much. This was just wonderful. Well, it's terrific. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Ed, thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you speaking very here. much. And uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to, to to work on many, many different points of view. It would be very helpful. Very. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.